if anyone has comments or questions for anyone from the paleontological um, group of speakers, uh, this is the time. We have about, uh, I think, 20 minutes scheduled. So another screen here. Um, yeah, we're, we're open till about 1030. So uh, we have 20 minutes of general commentary questions and anything you'd like to talk about. Somebody out there must have a conscience. Should we talk about either microconchids or the Cantabrian? How about microconchids in the Cantabrian? Were there any Cantabrian? <laughs> Those two things seem to have occupied a lot of our time. Yes, there were microconchids in the Cantabrian. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> What's, what's the Cantabrian? Hey, I, I have a question. I mean, we're getting to the point where we need to start putting, try to put everything together, okay? And what I want to know, and maybe some of the paleo, I mean, we've talked about this a little, what's happening across the Muscovian casamovian boundary? I mean, the vegetation is changing, but I thought Bill's comment yesterday that you're really going from one rainforest to a different rainforest, right? And now we've thrown into the mix, now we've got all the arthropods through Sandra and Mike Donovan. We kind of know more about the arthropod record and also the record of how arthropods are interacting with the plants. You know, if the vegetation's changing, why isn't there just a big jump in arthropod herbivory or a shift, you know? And I, I'm arguing, and I think Matt Stimson pretty much said the same thing. I think the tracks, not as well, but they show the same thing as the bones that we're getting this new, more terrestrial tetrapod fauna in the Casamovian or certainly by Gajelian time. So who's, who's got, maybe the giant brain of a Smithsonian curator can put something in. I'd actually, I'd actually like to, to, to comment this way that um, it seems from what I've learned here that there are things that happen throughout the Moscovian. And even at the, at the in the US it would be at the, uh, roughly at what will be the Bashkirian and whatever the Asturian is, as John Knights pointed out, we're not exactly sure what it is, but the Westphalian D, um, th that, there's something that happens at that boundary. Corditalians turn over the early Demoinsian. Then something happens at what looks like it's the, the base of the Moscovian as it's present, or at the base of the Casamovian as it's presently defined. And then something happens at the Missourian uh, Demoinsian boundary as it's currently defined. And some of those boundaries, um, like I, I would like to hear from our Russian colleagues, um, because the same way we've been able to identify, and, and Chinese colleagues also, the way we can identify where the, the um, Bazurian Demoinsian boundary was in the US was based on events, but it's now been moved to match a conodont. So now we can track it better with a conodont. But before it was based on palynological uh, and, and macro plant turnover mostly. And, and I wonder if the current Moscovian, what, what was the original reason for drawing the bottom of the Casamovian, the Moscovian Casamovian contact? What's the original reason they made that contact? It couldn't have been conodonts. It had to be some other reason, wasn't it? And then conodonts have come in and been used to find a way to identify it with conodonts. So why was it there? Did something lithologic happen at that boundary? Did was there a biological change in the marine fauna of some type? What, what marks that boundary? I don't know, but th things seem to happen there. And if you look on the land, tr tree ferns begin to show up in coal swamps at that time. Well, in, in, in the Moscow basin, I think it's the, it was brachiopods. It's the tegulifera horizon originally. I mean, I, I'm not, I don't want to speak for our Russian colleagues. Maybe Georgi... Morantsev can tell us something. He's on. Can you can you address this? I mean, you're just talking about the classic Moscovian Casamovian boundary, which really, as a chronostratigraphic unit, is originally a place in the Moscow basin where you got a change in facies. And my understanding from what I've read is it was mostly a distinctive brachiopod fauna that made that. It's just historically that. Mm -hmm. I wonder if, if you can cheese data in China show a, um, a major change at that boundary um, as well from the, the, is there an actual Moscovian-Casamovian boundary turnover in the marine fauna in general? 
Um, well, isn't, but isn't the data everybody showed us like on day one, particularly Barrick and Roscoe, that the real change is that younger change. It's in the Kamovnikian, the sort of middle Moscow, uh, middle Kasimovian, which is more or less the base of the Missouri. That's where the marine change looks the biggest. Yes? You can, can you comment on that, on what you see in your uh, data? Mm. If we just look at the data from my analysis, we can see a, there is a big drop from the, I said, a little time before the Um And then in the, in the middle of the moving, there is a, a climax of the origination rate. So I don't know, um, I didn't do the, the, um, um, the, uh, far not an over uh, analysis to the to the different groups. So I'm not sure um, if there gonna be a a major marine invertebrate turnover uh, around that time. Uh, I mean, before the the uh, a little time before the the base of Cassie moving, and also in the middle of Cassie moving. Uh, as I remembered the original uh, Kasimovian base in China was based on Fusulinus. So around that time, uh, if I'm wrong, uh, Xiangdong, please correct me. Um, around that time, the, um, uh, a totally different uh, a, a type of Fusulinus uh, started to evolve. Um, that's that's a kind of uh, a, a totally new family, and before that, we, we are talking about another family. Mm -hmm. So, um, because in China we have so many uh, from Nifra, um in the in the limestone, and we are mainly around the coniferous time, we are mainly have the uh, limestone strata. So um, we are basically based on that before Cornadons, I say, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. Bill Osage. Yeah, just just remind you that in the uh, in North American crinoids, um, they the diversity increases at the uh, Des Moines Missourian boundary, and so it isn't until later that they uh, that they crash, not until the Virgilian. Do you see anything in in the in the mid Des Moines that would have, uh, would would correlate with uh, with the Muscovy and Casamovian boundary as currently drawn? In uh, I, I don't think our data are fine enough to, to look at that actually, so I better not comment. And the, crin the crinoid, you know, database is basically a, a sampling of logish data, so it's not a real continuous uh, record that you could see things with. Sean Dong, did you want to comment on that? I, yes, around the set boundary, uh, we have uh, lithological changes with uh, with, with distinctly. And uh, the below the boundary, we call the waning formation or Huanglong formation. This is a little bit of, uh, uh, really light gray limestone. And uh, above the boundary, this is what we call the Chansan formation or Ma Ping formation. This is a kind of yellowish uh, massive limestone. And uh, uh, yeah, in terms of colors, because colors has the local endemic. Uh, uh, Color final appear from this boundary. This is we call the Kubingo filidase, the kind of massive colors just start from this boundary. Uh, the problem is the, the uh, shallow water faces and and the deep water faces. We, uh, we never found any conodons from shallow water faces from those uh, mapping formation or transfer formation. So we cannot correlate by conodons from uh, deep water deep water faces to the shallow water faces. So we don't know the boundary is uh, 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 to correlate them to the, the uh, uh, mid-continent. This is a problem. I see. I've got Andre Jasper, then Georgi Marantsev. Um, Andre, you're up first, so. Yeah, uh, I'm just wondering if instead of extinctions, we didn't have uh, moving, just moving, the biota moving uh, uh, 
dur during these times. Because uh, during the Permian, uh, we have in Gondwana, they are not exactly the same, but we, we have swamps here, we have uh, are really, we have tetrapods coming, uh, and uh, when the ice sheets are retracting, these this, uh, faunas and floras, they move uh, to higher latitudes. Uh, so uh, I'm curious if, when you are speaking about extinctions in the, in, 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 uh, the northern hemisphere, uh, if we are not talking about uh, the changing of environments and the environments moving to more higher latitudes. Uh, and we, we, we got uh, uh, what you had uh, during the, the Mississippi and, and during the Pennsylvania, uh, uh, here in Gondwana, during the Permian. It's just, just uh, I think that's a very interesting suggestion. And given the not very good nature of a lot of the terrestrial record, um, that the movement of things out of your sampling windows could certainly be the case. We just don't see what's happening. Um, I don't know if that, that's, I don't know enough about the marine record to know if that would be true. And I, you're, you're next. So why don't we take, hear what you have to say about the marine record. And I see uh, both Jörg Schneider and John Wilson are lit up. I'll come back to them. Uh, hello, I just uh, want to make a short comment um, about historical, uh, mm, how uh, the Simoian stage was proposed in uh, the Moscow Basin. Uh, first, uh, Ivanov proposed uh, a Tibuliferina um, uh, horizon uh, based on uh, Brachiopod uh, Tibuliferina. Uh, and uh, this Brachiopod occurs uh, in the Nivero formation, not in the um, uh, base of the Casimiroan, but inside uh, the Nivero formation in the Harmonikian. And then uh, Dungeon uh, proposed the uh, Casimiroan stage. So uh, the proposal for the Casimiroan was uh, um, at first uh, Brachiopods. Brachiopods. Okay. okay. So something happens in the marine realm there that was seen, and that's that was the basis of the proposal. So there is an event, something evolutionary or whatever happens there. Uh, if we take the classical uh, uh, Simovian Moscovian boundary, uh, so I said before, uh, large uh, corals and uh, editates, uh, mm, they uh, talk to. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they do not continue to, ex to exist and uh, but if we take crinoids uh, their assemblage uh, uh, late Moscovian and uh, lower Simovian are nearly the same oh. okay so kind of a biostratigraphic boundary um, John you, you, you've been lit up for a while and then Jorg and then Spencer Yes, thanks. Thanks, Bill. I actually just wanted to um, uh, speak to what uh, what Andre brought up, which is, I, th I think, a really good point that there's, you know, w working in the terrestrial realm, you know, we know that we have these sampling windows that, op that open and close. And so it can be difficult sometimes to, to, to disentangle, uh, you know, a, a, an extinction from a local extirpation. You know, it's lost from this basin, but it remains in another basin, uh, you know, f uh, relatively far away. And so I think that's just, uh, I just wanted to uh, you know, sort of give a thumbs up to what Andre said. I think that's that's not that's a, a part of I think what's going on here and why it's challenging to reconcile some of these records. Great, thanks, John. I agree. York. Um, when we talk, talk, we talk all the time about the European region. We need to understand what happens in the continent continental uh, uh, environment. We need more information from, from Gondwana and from Northern Russia. Uh, yeah. This is really a, a bias in our knowledge. So we have to try in our Northern Marine Marine Coalition Marine Corps. We have to extend our uh, cooperation to the south and to the north. And then we will possibly find some answers uh, on the processes in the continental region. 
There's only a comment, no question. Thank you. Spencer, then Sandra. Um, let me just talk again about this chronostratigraphic definition of the base of the Casimovian. Everyone needs to remember that the history of chronostratigraphy can be divided into two time intervals, right? It's changing right around the 1960s. These old workers who worked in the Moscow basin, and this is true throughout the Phanerozoic, people went in and they defined what we call unit stratotypes. And believe me, the men and women who were working in the Moscow basin 100 years ago, they weren't looking at global correlations. They were just going through a section, looking for where the big lithologic and biotic changes were. So the base of the Casimovian was, it's a formation boundary, and it's also a change in the brachiopod fauna. It was not intended to be a global construct when it was first proposed. And in fact, and, and Bill Berggren and, and Jan Hardenball wrote a good paper about this years ago, most of these classic stages are, are sequences. They have sequence boundaries. They represent transgressive events, and most of them are unconformity bounded. That's very different from what we've been trying to do since the 1960s, which is, I call it, the, it's GSSP chronostratigraphy, where we're looking for a signal, an event, a marker, in this case, mostly conodon events, to just peg in the base of a stage. You know, we're trying, and I'll talk about this a little in my talk, but you have to remember that. So it's an apples and orange comparison in a way to talk about the original definitions of things like Casimovian. And now we're gonna to try to redefine or perhaps define the Casimovian using a different approach. Okay. Bill? Yeah, I think yeah. that makes it clear. Yeah, and I mean, I, I always say this to my students that, you know, all the, the classic boundaries were defined based on gaps. And now we're wringing our hands because we can't fill in the gaps. Right. So, now, yeah, it's a, you go back. a completely yeah, different philosophy. Right. If you go back and look, and this is Hardin, Bowl, and Berger, and if you look at the tertiary stages, you know, uh, like in the Paleocene, Eocene, Phoenician, Apresia, Lutetian, they're all gap bounded. They're all sequence bounded. And, and this became very obvious when Vale, Mitchum, and Thompson, when sequence stratigraphy came along, because the sequence stratigraphers identified the same packages of rocks that people like Charles Lyell had identified in the 1800s as stages. So this is a big problem because we want now, we want the chronostratigraphic boundaries to be in continuous, so-called continuous successions. Yet we're also trying to honor the priority, the history of the term. So you know, I would say to you, I, I think the base of the Casimovian and the Moscow Basin looks like a sequence boundary to me. It looks like an unconformity. I don't want that to be the exact base. Now, I think Goryeva's data shows that Suedalina subexcelsa or whatever only appears a few meters above that. Well, maybe that conodont's appearing in a more continuous succession and we could hammer in our golden spike there. You know what I'm saying? But this has been a big problem in the whole Phanerozoic chronostratigraphy, because, and I'll talk about this, an argument between priority. I've got an old concept like Casimovian, and I wanna honor it, but I've got a new method that will not exactly honor it no matter what I do. Okay, one last question from Sandra. Yeah, thank you. So um, thinking about everything that is happening during this time, it's of course like a, it's a false dichotomy to choose between abiotic changes and evolution because they influence each other. But it seems like a lot of the things that people have been talking about, the replacement of one rainforest by another, tetrapods doing a better job of living actually on land or insects doing a better job of eating plants. Those seem like primarily evolutionary changes um, as opposed to reactions to environmental changes. And then comparing you know, the Mississippian to the Permian, there's a whole lot that had to happen during the Pennsylvanian. And a lot of those changes don't necessarily need to be tied to each other. And it seems like there isn't really a null hypothesis of how many contemporaneous changes we would expect to see just based on the fact that you have a bunch of things that happened, you don't have all that much time, and you don't have great temporal resolution. And so I was just wondering if, if I guess there's not much time, but if there is someone who has generated a null hypothesis, so to speak, 
of how many things we would expect to see happening around the same time as each other that aren't necessarily directly related. I think that's interesting. You'd need a, <clears throat> you'd need to have to generate a null hypothesis. You'd need to know the drivers so that you could say, uh, here are the things that I believe are changing that are driving the system. And based on those things, I would expect these things to happen. Um, and then I can go back. Is that basically what you're saying? Do we need something like that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that also, if you just have a whole bunch of things happening in not very many tens of millions of years, and you don't have great temporal resolution, I think that you would expect by chance to see a bunch of things happening at the same time that are unrelated to each other. Could that be modeled? Yeah, I mean, well, you'd, I guess you'd need to decide what counts as a change that is big enough to require an explanation and how and the amount of time that that change would take. But yeah, I think it, it could be pretty simple to, to generate some kind of crude null hypothesis of, you know, we would expect changes in crinoids and changes in plants to happen at the same time, at least once, if we, you know, if we observe X number of changes within X number of millions of years. We, we should talk more about that after the next session. That's a very interesting idea. I, I find it a bit repellent as a paleontologist. I'm all into cause and effect. You know what I mean? I, I, I don't want to believe anything happens on the Darwinian planet without an underlying cause, you know? I mean, I wouldn't argue that there is no cause as much as we might not be able to determine all of the causes with the information that we have today. And so if we are overstating our confidence in what we think the causes are, or if we are misattributing the causes, it's interesting to me to think about how much trouble are we getting ourselves into by doing that. Gotcha. Let's talk about this more. It's a great idea. It's an interesting problem. <laughs>